we just commend ourselves to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you that we can come into your presence. We come in the name of the Lord Jesus, knowing that we are accepted in him. Indeed, we are loved. We are loved as he is loved. It is a marvelous thing that you have showered your favor upon us in this way. And we come this morning in humility, recognizing our indebtedness to you, recognizing our unworthiness, but rejoicing in the place to which you have brought us in your Son. We would look to you as we open your word. We thank you that you have seen fit to give us such a revelation from yourself, of yourself, and we pray that you would help us as we read to understand and to respond as we should. We commit ourselves to you for this. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Well, I do want to go back to the book of Job. If you'd like to turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Job, I intend uh, skimming through various chapters here, several chapters, so it would be helpful if you had your Bible in front of you so that you can follow <clears throat> better where it is we are going. We saw last week that um, Satan, with God's permission, he had brought various afflictions into the life of Job. He lost his possessions, and then he lost his family. His wife was no, no comfort to him. She has been described as Satan's tool, and she suggested that he curse God and die. His friends came along, and as we'll see this morning, they really didn't bring much comfort, although that was their intention. They intended to comfort, but as it turned out, there wasn't much comfort there. They sit in silence for seven days. And then Job breaks the silence and he pours out his heart. One might say he pours out his complaints as he expresses how he feels. Now from chapter 4 of the book of Job on to chapter 31, what we have is a description of a dialogue or dialogues that take place between Job and his three friends. Uh, they are in three cycles. The first cycle is in chapters uh, 8 through 14. Eliphaz speaks and Job responds. Zophar speaks and Job responds. Bildad speaks and Job responds. The second cycle follows the same pattern in chapters 15 to 21. The third cycle is in chapters 22 to 27. And there only Eliphaz and, uh, and Zophar speak. Bildaz, Bildad does not have a contribution in that section. So there are eight speeches in all from his three friends and eight replies from Job. And then in chapters 28 to 31, Job summarizes, he makes his final, final speech uh, to, his, uh, to his friends. Samuel Redout, he says about this section in the book of Job, it has been well named the entanglement for it is a mass of argument, denunciation, accusation, suspicion, partly correct theories, and virtual flashes of faith and hope, but little clarity in the controversy. When we get to the end of the book, God will speak to Job, and uh, he will, actually, he will speak to Eliphaz, and he will rebuke Eliphaz because he says, you have not spoken what is right about me, as my servant Job has. Now, that does not mean that everything that Job said about God was good and true, and we will see that this morning. Nor does it mean that everything that Job's friends spoke was error, because they do have some things to say that are, that are very good. Nevertheless, for the most part, they've got it wrong, and certainly, when it comes to an explanation for Job's suffering, they, they don't understand at all. It's a difficult question, isn't it? This whole question of suffering is an old, well, it's as old as mankind. And the problem of suffering is, is not easy. Uh, people approach it in different ways. For some people, it's a problem relating to the existence of God. Of course, if you don't believe in God, there is no point in, 
in thinking about suffering or talking about a reason for suffering because, well, we are just the victims of blind chance and things happen. You have no control over those things. And so there isn't any point in wondering, well, why is it that we suffer? But even those who, who are inclined to believe that there's a God, this is a challenge. How can there be a God if he allows this kind of thing to go on, apparently, with indifference? For other people, it's not so much the existence of God. It's a question about the knowledge of God. Does, does God really know what's going on? Or it may be a question about the power of God. Can God do anything about it? Or it may be a question about the character of God. If God knows what's going on, and God is able to do something about it, then why doesn't he do something? What kind of God is he? And see, these are some of the questions that are right. Well, Job's, Job's friends, they have the explanation. They understand. And so Eliphaz uh, comes to Job in chapter 4, and he explains to him what is going on. You'll notice how he begins there in verse 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Uh, he approaches him gently. He approaches him respectfully. He approaches him, I think we might say, sympathetically. He understands that he is going through a difficult time, and so he is uh, he's careful about the way in which he introduces himself. But then he very quickly attacks Job, and he suggests uh, he knows what the problem is. And it's summed up for us, I think, in three statements. The first statement is there in verse 7. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent or where were the upright ever cut off, even as I have seen? Those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish. By the breath of his anger they're consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perishes for lack of prey. The clubs of the lioness are scattered. Basically what he's saying is God is a God who punishes the wicked, and he's a God who blesses the righteous, whoever perished, being innocent. He believed in divine retribution. And we believe in divine retribution. There certainly is such a thing as divine retribution, and that will be apparent one day when the dead, small and great, will stand before God and they will be judged for the things that they have done. But even in this life, sometimes God does deal in a punitive way with people. Moreover, sometimes he deals with his children, and he chastens, doesn't he? The writer of the Hebrews tells us that. He says, what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And we are the sons of God, and so we can expect that, that God may well bring into our lives things which are not comfortable, things which are not enjoyable, and he has his purpose in doing that. And so we do believe in divine retribution, and we do believe in divine chastisement on occasions, but we certainly do not believe that one can look at an individual who's suffering and say, well, you're suffering, you must have sinned. That's what Eliphaz is saying. Eliphaz is saying to Job, you know, get real, Job. There's only one explanation for what is going on. Remember, whoever perished being innocent, it's obvious that you must have sinned. And then he says, secondly to him, down at verse 17, he claims to have had a vision, and in this vision he has heard a voice which says this, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? God is, God is just, isn't he? Job is maintaining that he is righteous. He's not perfect, but he's maintaining that he's righteous. He doesn't done anything that warrants the kind of suffering to which he has been exposed. And, uh, and Eliphaz is challenging him, and he's saying, well, would you, would you, wouldn't you think that God is a better a judge of justice and righteousness than you are? Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Would you defend yourself and presume to know better than God? And then thirdly, down at verse, um, at ver at, at verse 17 of chapter 5, he says this, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects, 
Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. If I can summarize it, what he's basically said is, first of all, Job, be realistic. You must have sinned. That's the only explanation for the situation in which you find yourself. And secondly, be humble. Instead of boasting about your righteous or resting in your righteousness, you acknowledge that you have sinned. You humble yourself before God. And then thirdly, you be submissive. Recognize that God is dealing with you. Repent of your sin and return to the Lord. That is his message. And if you go through the other seven uh, speeches uh, from Job's friends, you will discover that this is the message which they constantly present. You must have sinned, Job. That's the only explanation for your suffering. It's, by the way, it's something which uh, we, might, uh, we might think, well, why would they be so hard on him? But there is a sense, in, there isn't there, in which um, we sometimes, we, we, we sort of look at situations and we wonder, you may well have asked this question, as you look at somebody, and that's what has happened to him, you might well have asked the question, well, what did he do to deserve that? Either in a good sense or a bad sense. Or maybe we look at someone and say, well, um, he's getting what he deserves. There is an assumption on our part, isn't there, that uh, and that's the way it ought to be, right? That there ought to be some kind of justice and, uh, and that indeed the good should receive good things and that the evil should be dealt with accordingly. I think the only movie I ever watched twice was The Sound of Music. And uh, there is a scene in that movie where um, uh, Von Trapp announces his love for Maria. And she responds to that. And she says, uh, here you are standing there loving me. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. This, this assumption and that good behavior warrants good treatment from God. And it works the other way around as well. You remember, for example, on one occasion, the Lord Jesus met that man who was blind, and, uh, and some of the folks there, quick to criticize, uh, they said, well, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind? I don't know what they had in mind, by the way, by asking, did this man sin before he was born? Now, that's what they're saying, right? Who sinned? This man or his parents, and he was born blind, but whatever. Certainly there is this assumption on their part that uh, there is suffering here, and so there must be sin. We have another example of it in the book of the Acts, where Paul is shipwrecked on the Isle of Malta, and then they're making a fire. And so he's gathering some sticks uh, for this fire, and a viper attaches itself to him. And the natives, they see what's happening, and they assume that he's going to die. And they say, no doubt this man is a murderer whom justice does not allow to live. There is this assumption uh, that something bad happens. Well, that's because of bad behavior. Sin results in, in suffering. It's a very straightforward philosophy. God is righteous, God is judge. The law of retribution applies. In this life, good people receive good things, and bad people receive bad things. That's their message. So Job responds to this. Turn over with me now to Job chapter, I told you we were gonna skim through these chapters. That's me dealt with two chapters already. Uh, we come to chapter six, and Job responds to this, and uh, notice how he begins in chapter 6 and at verse 1. Job answered and he said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales. Basically what he's saying is, you folks, or you Eliphaz in particular, you're presenting a balanced scale theology, tit for tat. God plays tit for tat. We sin, he punishes. We do good, he blesses. Well, he says, that doesn't really work in my case. And she says, oh, that my grief were fully weighed. If all of my troubles, all that has come upon me, upon me, the suffering that I'm experiencing, 
And the way that I feel, if that was put on the scale, then it would far outweigh any evil that I may have done. Verse 3, then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been rash. I've spoken the way I've spoken for good reason. I don't believe what you're saying, Eliphaz. You're telling me that I must have, uh, I must have sinned. I don't believe that. Your philosophy, your philosophy is all wrong. God is afflicting me. But it's certainly not because I deserve it. Job would maintain that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Actually, the Lord Jesus taught this, didn't he? You remember on one occasion he... Uh, he drew attention, he drew attention to the, a number of Galileans who had been killed by Herod. And he asked his audience the question, do you suppose these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans? I tell you no, tell you no, don't jump to conclusions. He, he points to something that happened where the tower of Siloam had fallen and a number of people had been killed. And he said, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwell in Jerusalem? So they experienced this uh, accident. Do you think that means they were worse than everybody else? Did God pick them because of that? I tell you, I tell you no. It doesn't work. Your philosophy is wrong. One of the clearest illustrations, incidentally, of this is the, is the Lord Jesus himself, isn't it? When the Lord was on the cross, uh, you remember what they said, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if you will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. There was this assumption on their part that uh, he had made some outrageous claims, and he was suffering because he was a liar and a deceiver and a fraud. God was giving him what he deserved. This morning at our earlier meeting, Kevin read from Isaiah 53, and he read these words. The words which actually could be put into the lips of those who were there at the cross of the Lord Jesus. We did a stream him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That was their assumption. God is smiting them. He's getting what he deserves. He's not who he claims to be. And so God is dealing with him. And there was this assumption that the Lord Jesus was there suffering because of sin in his life. They had it partly right. He was indeed smitten and stricken of God and afflicted. But it wasn't for anything he had done. It was for our sins. It wasn't that the Lord Jesus deserved to be there. Certainly not. Indeed, you remember the words of the dying thief. One of them had railed on the Lord Jesus and said, well, if you are who you claim to be, come down from the cross and save yourself, save us. And the other one says, look, you don't know what you're talking about. We are getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing amiss. He wasn't there because he'd done something wrong. He was there on account of our sins. So as far as Job is concerned, he maintains that he's righteous, not perfect, but he lives, he lives a good life. He fears God. God himself says that back in chapter 1. And he shuns evil. He was a man who was upright. God saw him that way and blameless. And Job says, so I'm righteous. I don't deserve this suffering. I haven't done anything to deserve this. Your philosophy is wrong. Then secondly, he says, your words are empty. Look at verse 14. He says, to him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. You're, you're my friends. Claim to be my friends. You've come to visit me. Appreciate that. And you've sat with me in silence for seven days. I appreciate that. But, uh, but you're disappointing me. You, you have nothing to offer. He goes on and he says in verse 15, My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away, which are dark because of the ice and into which the snow vanishes. When it is warm, they cease to flow. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. He refers here to Wadi Brooks. I remember a number of years ago, I was in Pakistan and we were traveling from uh, Islamabad up to Baltistan. We never got there because there was an avalanche. And so we had to turn around and come back as we made our way through the mountains. But at one point, we came across a fairly flat area, and, um, and Al Lowry, who was a missionary in Pakistan at that time, 
uh, was with us and he was driving. I said, what is that? I mean, why have we got this raised road across this, this area? And he said, well, that's a waddy, waddy pool. And uh, when the rain falls, this whole area is flooded. But for much of the year, there's nothing. Well, that's what, that's, what, uh, that's what Job is saying. He says, my brothers have dealt with, dealt deceitfully like a brook. Uh, we expect something, but there's nothing there. Indeed, he says that when you go down to verse 19, the caravans of Tema look, in other words, traveling traders as they're on their journey. They expect to find some water. Now, the caravans of Tema look, the travelers of Sheba hope for them. They're disappointed because they were confident. They come there and they're confused. Your words are empty. There's no substance to them. They're not really bringing me any comfort at all. The message that you present is a message which is, which is empty. The wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world, when all is said and done, you see, the wisdom of the world is futile and is empty. The Apostle Paul, he talks about this when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in fact, he says that human wisdom may be eloquent and clever and logical, but at the end of the day, it is futile. He says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Man by his wisdom, he says, he does not know God. Man by his wisdom, he has attempted to arrive at um, an explanation for life and to answer the big questions that, uh, that perplex us. And in so doing, they have rejected the revelation that God has given. And they have substituted a philosophy of naturalism, which denies the existence of God. And they have assumed that they can arrive at the answers in themselves. And in the end, they have arrived at this. The wisdom of this world is foolishness by their wisdom that they did not know God. When I was in high school, um, Bertrand Russell and that's probably a name that uh, most of you don't recognize, but Bertrand Russell, back in the uh, 1950s, he was a very well-known individual in the UK, very intelligent, very articulate. He was a philosopher and a mathematician and very outspoken on a number of social issues. And uh, we had to read some of his stuff when I was in high school. And in one of his essays, he, uh, he puts forward uh, what he believes, and he sums it up in a number of statements. He says, let me read, God, men's origin, growth, hopes and fears, loves and beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. That's uh, an interesting way of saying it. You know, we came from nothing, right? We're an accident. And then he says, no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. Well, suddenly that's true. Then he says, all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. And then he says, the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. He is a man who subscribes to naturalism, doesn't believe in God, believes in evolution, don't know where we came from, don't know where we're going, and uh, we don't know why we're here. And this is how he sums it up. This is what he says. Only within the scaffolding of these truths only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation be safely built. Man's wisdom is foolishness to God. It is empty. It is futile. It leaves us floundering in the darkness with no moral compass, with no purpose, and with no hope. But Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says, yeah, man's wisdom is foolishness to God, but he says, we preach Christ. We preach Christ. Mind you, he says to the Greeks, that is foolishness. They don't understand. It is inconceivable. To them, it is inconceivable that God would become like one of his creatures. I mean, they were... They, they, they believed in... Uh, well, the word that was used was apatheia. They believed in uh, that God was indifferent. The gods were indifferent. 
So we, we were creating, well, okay, but he's left us on our own. He doesn't care what's happening. To suggest that God would become like one of his creatures and suffer, well, that was out of nonsense. Could not possibly be. And then Paul says, as far as the Jews are concerned, it's a stumbling block. Of course it is. They, they have expectations of a Messiah. The kind of Messiah that they're looking for is a Messiah who will establish them as a power to be reckoned with on the earth and who will reign in power and glory and that their Messiah should come and be brutally crucified. Well, that didn't, just didn't fit. Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. And to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. But to those of us who are being saved, it is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. The foolishness of God, if I can put it that way, as far as man is concerned, why, it is the wisdom, the wisdom of God. So he says, your, your words are empty. Third thing he says is when we get down to verse, um, verse 24. First he said, your philosophy is false. And now he's saying, your words are empty, empty, you're not helping me at all. And now when we get down to verse 24, he says, your accusations are false. Teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I have erred. You say that I've sinned. All right. Well, what have I done? What have I done? You know me. You know the kind of person that I am. You know how I treat uh, my servants. You know how I deal with other people. You know how I manage my business affairs. You know about me, so tell me, what have I done? What have I done? There's no response. He, you get down to the end of the chapter in verse uh, 29, and he says, yield now, let there be no injustice. You know, be honest, can you point to anything that I've done? Yes, conceit, my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? And so his message, his response, his response to Eliphaz's uh, philosophy, you know, divine retribution, you must have sinned, Job. And that's the only explanation. You should humble yourself and acknowledge your sin. You should repent and you should turn to God. And Job says, your philosophy is all wrong. And your words are empty. And your accusations are false. And then in chapter 7, for the first time in this book, he turns to God. And he speaks directly to the Lord. And it's here that he will say some very harsh things and uh, difficult, difficult for us to, to understand that he would be able to express himself in such a way. His wife had said, curse God and die. And well, Job doesn't curse God, but he does say some very startling things here about God. He begins by talking about life. And so in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, life is futile. Is there not a time of hard service for man on earth? That's all there is to it, hard service. Are not his days also like the days of a hired man? A man who has been hired, um, maybe an indentured servant, and uh, he should serve for a certain period of time, but it's, uh, it's a long time, never seems to come to an end. Are not his days also like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade, like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages? Someone who's out there in the field working all day and longing for, longing for an end to the day when they can sit in the shade and, uh, and, be, uh, and be comfortable, but it doesn't seem to come. This is, what, this is what Job is, that's what life is like. He's saying that it is, it is futile, it's pointless. And then he says it's brief, verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they're spent without hope. Not only like a weaver's shuttle, which moves back and forth quickly, but he says in verse 7, remember my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. And again in verse 9, he says, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall return, never return to his house, nor his place shall his place know him anymore. 
Life is brief. Years are going by. As far as Job is concerned, there is suffering. There is no dignity. There is no rest. There is no joy. There is no hope. There is no meaning. Life is futile. And life is brief. And then he says, life is painful. Verse 11, therefore, I will not restrain my, my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. He feels it. This man's in pain. This man has experienced some dreadful things. And he's suffering in a physical way, but he's certainly suffering in an emotional way, isn't he? It was torture for him. What he has experienced, and uh, he sees God responsible. And so he says in verse 12, Am I a sea, a tempestuous sea that needs to be calmed, or a sea serpent, some monster from the sea that needs to be dealt with? For you set a guard against me. Why, why, why are you treating me this way? Life is painful. What's the point of it all? He will go on to say that there's no reason, there's no reason for him to live. He says in verse 15, so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath. It's almost as though he's asking God, well, give me a breather. Come on, I, and my, days, my life is short. Uh, can't you at least give me a few days of rest uh, to enjoy because uh, my life will soon be over. He's somebody who is in anguish that, uh, that he's suffering in this way and he's asking the Lord, uh, can I at least have a few days where I'm free from this affliction? And this is his, this is his view of life at this point. And so he asks some questions. And the first question he asks is, well, why don't you leave me alone? Verse 17, he says, what is man that you exalt him? Uh, what is man that you should exalt him? Now, those words are familiar, aren't they? Those are words that come from the eighth psalm. What is man that you, that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? And there the psalmist uh, is writing in the first instance about Adam, because this is a description of what happened when Adam was created. But in a broader sense, it applies to mankind. Uh, God has shown his favor. God extends his favor to us in numerous ways. Day by day, we experience his goodness and the provision that he bestows upon us. And certainly, those of us who know the Lord Jesus, he has demonstrated his favor towards us in the most marvelous way that he has sent his son who died for us in order that we might be brought into a relationship with God. And the psalmist expresses his wonder. What is man? What is man that you're mindful of him? Why do you bother with him? I mean, he's so sinful and so weak. So why would you shower any kind of favor upon him? But here, when John uses these words, it's really a parody of what we have in Psalm, Psalm 8. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, not, not to bless him? John is not thinking, you know, well, man is so sinful and weak, why would you shower favor upon him? On the contrary, John is thinking, man is so weak and insignificant, why do you bother with him? Why do you make me suffer this way? Verse 18, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment. How long? Will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? Why don't you leave me alone? Basically, that is complained, isn't it? It's as though God is picking on him, like big brother. He's watching him all the time, and he's ready to, to deal with him in a punitive way, and he finds this, uh, he finds this so difficult. Why don't you leave me alone? And then secondly, in verse 20, <clears throat> he says, why, why do you target me? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of man? Again, he's not denying that he has sinned. He is a sinner. He knows it. But he certainly doesn't feel that he's been treated fairly. God is just. Well, how come I'm suffering in this way? Why, why are you dealing with me like this? Have I sinned in such a way as to warrant this kind of treatment? What have I done to you, or what sort of man? What have I done that affects you? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? And then he asks the third question in verse 21. Then he says, why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? 
Now, Job was somebody who knew something about forgiveness. I mentioned this last Sunday. Job was a man, and I've already quoted it again this morning. He was a man who was blameless and upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil, a man who knew that there was sin in his life, and he dealt with that sin. He was a man who would come to the Lord in repentance. He would bring the right sacrifice. We read about that in chapter 1. And so he knew, he knew the appropriate way to come to God, and, uh, and he would bring the right sacrifice, and he would, uh, and he would uh, acknowledge his sin and repent before the Lord. And he knew forgiveness. But now he says, why do you not pardon my transgression? I think what he's saying is, look here, I'm forgiven because you have promised and I have a, I've complied with what it is that you've specified. I'm forgiven. Why do you treat me as though I haven't been forgiven? Why do you treat me this way? Why then do you not pardon my transgression? Take away my iniquity and stop punishing me because of my sin. <laughs> well, it's awful, isn't it? And some of you are quite depressed and saying, why would you have come this morning? You know, this is, this is a very, very gloomy, gloomy picture, isn't it? Here's a man who's in anguish. Here's a man who's suffering. Here's a man who's angry. A man who's complaining. <clears throat> I mentioned last Sunday that in some respects, Job is a picture to us of the Lord Jesus. And that is true, uh, I mentioned, in terms of his greatness and his goodness and also in terms of his suffering. But here he stands in marked contrast to the Lord Jesus, doesn't he? The way he responds to his suffering, the confusion and the anger and the inappropriate speech. The Lord Jesus' response was altogether different. The Lord Jesus did not retaliate, certainly not. There was no anger on his part. There was no attempt on his part to complain, no complaint, no attempt to get God to somehow change the agenda so that he didn't have to go to the cross. The Lord Jesus was one who was submissive. He says, I, Lord, it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. That was the attitude of the Lord Jesus. The attitude of the Lord Jesus is expressed in his words on another occasion. He said, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. And so there was submissiveness, and there was obedience, and there was a willingness to die on our account, because that was the will of his Father. But Job wasn't like that. Job, as I say, is angry and frustrated and disappointed, and he complains. <clears throat> but before I conclude, let me suggest that we ought not to be too hard on Job. And I would suggest that for two reasons. First of all, I would suggest we shouldn't be too hard on him because he was honest. He was honest. We should give him credit for that. He's a man who's hurting. He comes to God. He doesn't put on a front. He doesn't pretend that everything is fine but he tells God exactly how he feels. Now, admittedly, the language that he uses is not language that I rec would recommend that we use, but give him credit. He's honest. He's not playing games. He's not trying to come to God the way we might think God would expect him to come to God. He's not saying the things that he thought, well, this is what I should say. He's not doing that. He's laying it on the line, and he's saying, this is how I feel. He's honest. And I find it interesting when we come to the end of the book or to chapter 40 where God speaks that God would rebuke him but not because of his attitude. God will rebuke him because of his lack of understanding. God doesn't say to him, Job, you shouldn't have used those, that language. He doesn't say, you shouldn't have spoken about me in that way. And on the contrary, in chapter 42, he will say to Eliphaz, he says, you have not spoken about me what is right as my servant Job has. He commends Job in spite of what is going on here. And so I suggest to you that God was, God recognized, God recognized the pain that he was experiencing. God knew what he was going through. God understood. 
We might think that we're, when we are in a very difficult situation, you know, that we need to come to God in a particularly pious way. Well, certainly when we come to God, we should come reverently and we should come humbly. But at the same time, we shouldn't, we shouldn't come with any kind of pretense. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, he knows how we feel. So there's no point in putting on a front and trying to behave in a way as though everything was all right and thinking, well, this is what God would expect of me. No, I don't think the Lord wants us to come the way we are and the way we feel because he understands and he cares. The old hymn says, does Jesus care when my heart is pained? too deeply for mirth or song. As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long, does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. The Lord cared for Job. Yeah, he's hurting. <clears throat> and he says, he says some things that uh, we might think, you shouldn't have said that, Job. But the Lord understands. And the Lord cares. So we should give him credit for his honesty. And Saturn light, we need to give Job credit for his trust. <clears throat> Here's a man <clears throat> who's hurting. His wife says, curse God and die. But he's not about to curse God. Or certainly not. He will say some harsh things about God. He has done that in this chapter. But nevertheless, he's not giving up on God. He's holding on to God. He will say it later in this book. He says, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. Doesn't matter what happens to him, there is this confidence in God, and I think we need to recognize that. And that we ought not to be hard on Job. We ought not to criticize Job. We ought to try to put ourselves in Job's shoes and ask ourselves the questions, how would we respond in a situation like that? And how would our trust stand up? I mean, let's face it, Job, Job didn't have anything like the, the knowledge or the privileges that you and I have. Job didn't have a Bible. Not one book. He would have had oral tradition that had come down all the way from Adam and from Noah, but he had, uh, he had no Bible. He had no Bible. He had some knowledge of God, certainly, as one who was sovereign and righteous, and uh, perhaps he had a sense of God's grace and his provision for him, but, but he didn't have the understanding of God's ways and of God's character that we have. He didn't have the revelation of God that we have in the Word of God, and especially the revelation of God that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't have that. He had some knowledge of sacrifice. We saw that last week, and he brings a sacrifice. He's aware that this is what God expects and that he's accepted by God if he comes in the right way on the basis of his sacrifice. But I doubt he had any idea that those sacrifices somehow pointed forward to the one final sacrifice for sin which would be offered by the Lord Jesus. We have that knowledge. We know that the Lord Jesus, he offered one sacrifice for sins forever and he sat down at the right hand of God. And we can revel in that. We can rejoice in that. As we did this morning, recognizing that the death of the Lord Jesus was a substitutionary death. He was there on our account. Job didn't know that. Job had some vague ideas about the future. Some of it actually you wondered about because back in verse 10, he says about the man who goes down to the grave, he shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. And one wonders, well, okay, what is, that, uh, what is it that you're thinking about, Job, as you, as you look to what follows after death? But later in the book, it becomes clear he does have a hope. Though after my death, worms shall destroy my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. What did he know? We certainly didn't know what we know. Certainly didn't know that the Lord Jesus is going to come down from heaven with a shout 
And the dead in Christ are going to be raised, and we who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up together with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, and we will be with the Lord. We shall be like the Lord, because we shall see the Lord as he is. Job didn't have that kind of knowledge. But he trusted. He trusted in God. And so I conclude by suggesting that he's a challenge to us. How would we respond if we found in ourselves in a situation where all of the props are removed and it's just God and me? The psalmist says in Psalm 62, verse 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Father, we thank you for your word again. <clears throat> thank you that we've been able to read it. Thank you that you've seen fit to preserve this record of what went on between Job and his friends for us. And these are puzzling chapters. Some of the things that are said are puzzling. And yet you and your wisdom, you've seen fit to preserve those. You directed in the composition of these chapters. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And so we thank you that we are able to read and to think and to consider how these things might relate to our situation. We pray, Father, that you would help us this morning uh, to relate to Job in some way. We've never experienced what Job experienced, never experienced, in, uh, never experienced anything like it. Help us, nevertheless, to, to identify with him and to identify with him particularly in his confidence in you and in his unshakable faith. We thank you for your word and for this time together. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.